So, um, the other thing we talked about last night about groundwater, what, what do we do with all this? What do we do with all our water supply? What is the most our water supply? I mean, this is one of the things I think can be a little bit surprising to students is that as the more we use water for, the first thing is probably going to be drinking water. <laughs> right? That's the most important thing. That's how they use it, how we all use it. But, um, that's only a, a small fraction. So, sort of public supply is only about 11%. So, it's a significant jump, but they aren't the biggest jump. And one of the things there, the, the national standards definitely emphasize is they want to know what some of the biggest uses are. And you can see from here, right, um, irrigation, a pretty big factor here, about 31%. So a lot of our water use actually goes to irrigation, right? The other big one down here is uh, thermoelectric power supply. Right? Those are our two biggest water uses. And that's is, the this is, this is at, throughout the nation as well. This is in the U.S. So that's where most of our water use comes for the country. It's probably similar in South Carolina. I'm not sure exactly what the, you know, how the ratio has changed a little bit, but probably somewhat similar, but it might change, decrease, and decrease one of those things a little bit more or less. Other questions on this? So those are definitely our biggest uses. And this is, uh, I think, why. You know, the, the standards that they wrote focus a lot on, you know, how is groundwater and energy connected. And you can see why, from this figure here, why they're so concerned with that. You know, with, you know, you know about 40, 50 percent, depending on how you get from the for water supply, doing the power generation, right, the power needs. Again, because most power plants um, need water. Almost what all power plants do is they need water to create steam to turn a turbine to power generator. Uh, the question is just how you use the water. <laughs> but they almost all, with the exception of wind, um, uh, solar, um, you know, and certain types of solar, not all solar, need um, the water, right? Um, so that, that, that's why it's such a big thing to say. We heard a little bit about this in the other ones. Um, but so we have all this water, we use it different ways, but then the next question is, who has the right to use that water and how much of it, right? You just saw we have a bunch of different needs. So we have to balance all those different needs, not only within a community, but also between a community. And one of the biggest uh, battles in our area right now is over the uh, Concord of Annapolis um, wants to withdraw about, well, they're going to prove to withdraw about 10 million gallons a day. Right? Their initial request was 25 million gallons a day. They were approved for 10 million gallons a day. Um, and this is uh, South Carolina and slide to North Carolina because they say, well, that's too much. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. So the governing body of North Carolina just means that they approved the 10 million gallon transfer. Um, and there were actually, it's a really complicated and interesting case because South Carolina didn't want them to do that. All right, so um, here's the photographer coming down here eventually. Uh, close the lake watery and turns into a watery river, right? So they're basically transferring, doing interface and transfer. Here you can see the edge of the watershed, and they're actually moving it outside to the boundaries of that watershed, right? So it's something that's called interface and transfer. And that's partially why this is such a big deal, because it was to be taken from the water water watershed, put into another one, and it's not going to return, right? So that's why it's such an even more of a bigger deal than if you were to use water for some sort of power generation, some of that will come back, right? Some of that is flowed through, some of that will return to that watershed. And so that's not quite the big deal. Here we're moving out of the watershed all together. So there are actually, uh, there's the South Carolina North Carolina lawsuit. There's also been some legal action from the Catawba River Keepers and some other um, agents, some other towns here in North Carolina also opposed this, right? And then South Carolina opposed it. Um, it's currently going before the Supreme Court. The most recent ruling on this was just um, earlier this year, the Supreme Court ruled that um, there were a number of entities that were trying to become part of the lawsuit, saying that they had a stake in this um, legal fight and they wanted to have a voice you know, before the court uh, in terms of having an uh, input on what the decision finally would be here. Um, and there was a mixed ruling on that. There were three parties that wanted to be included in the lawsuit. What the Supreme Court did is they said, well, Charlotte was one of these. Because they're worried about you know providing water for their communities, and the Supreme Court said you can't be a part of this. 
right? North Carolina, the state of North Carolina is adequately represented. They said, we're saying no to you. They did say yes to Duke Power and the Catawba River Supply Project, uh, in part because both of these operate in both North and South Carolina. So the court's thinking on that was, well, you're not really adequately represented by North Carolina or South Carolina. You sort of straddle the line, so we're going to say that you can have a seat. Um, that's as far as the legislation has made it, um, but you'll probably be hearing more about this. It probably has the ability to set precedent for um, water rights in the you know, eastern part of the United States. Um, previous speaker said that uh, as water rights are determined in California, so they are in the rest of the state. Um, I think we're going to correct that a little bit. Uh, Western water rights and eastern water rights are done a little bit differently, and Josh will talk a little bit more about that. Uh, California and the East United States, they, they work out water rights a little bit differently. So we can talk about that. Um, one way that uh, we can actually try and protect our water supply uh, is through proper riparian buffers. And those of you that are familiar with these riparian refers to habitat alongside the street. Right, so riparian buffer is a buffer that exists alongside the stream. Um, and there are different ways these are designed. And sort of the typical buffer design is something like this. Here you have your river and your stream system. Right? And then you have a planned series of communities that go out to whatever your human use, agriculture, or whatever it happens to be out here. In between the river and whatever human use you have, you have a zone here of unmanaged forest, right? So just whatever happens to grow grows. Then you sort of plant in and put a managed forest, right? With taller trees, right? And then you have sort of a native grasses area, and then your human use. And the thought is that those grasses will help absorb some of the stuff, roots to trees, the particular trees you choose to plant there will help absorb uh, nutrients uh, that might be contaminating the water supply, sediment that might be washing in, um, those sorts of things. And that's sort of how you design a riparian buffer. And the rule of thumb here is basically the, the bigger the better. Um, they can be as little as 50 feet and they can go out from there. Um, and the idea here is that the, the bigger that buffer, the more benefit you get from it. And with this figure, it's sort of hard to read here. Um, but it will be on a PowerPoint that we'll have up on Josh's blog or sort of put on it because I'm maybe not going to see you or not. But, um, no, okay, we'll post it. Like, yeah, we'll, we'll post it. We're going to our students not doing stuff on time. Yeah. <laughs> but as you, as you go further out, so here we're going from about uh, zero feet to about 300 foot buffer, you start getting increasing benefits if you do that. You start with bank stabilization, some of these uh, roots and things help stabilize the bank. The bank the um, you get some habitat benefits from that. Uh, you get nutrient and sediment control, flood control, and the wildlife habitat. 